Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic day. I am Jonathan Little. Still a tiny bit under the weather. It's only been two weeks. You think it'd be better by now. Maybe I should go to the doctor. So this may be a short show. I have a webinar today, a private webinar with some students, and um, I need to make sure my voice still works. So if I can't talk by the end of this, we may have a problem. Still have our morning coffee, though. All right. Today, I want to talk about something that is coming up for me and for many of you, maybe not this specific tournament, hopefully it is, um, but you will play a tournament series in the future. So what I want to discuss today is preparing for the Party Poker Millions UK. Now, this is a big tournament series that is a bit of a commitment for me, right? Because it's not like I'm just going down the street to play a poker tournament. I am flying from New York to Nottingham to play the tournament. And I realize that a lot of you travel to play poker. It may be um, a flight away, a car ride away, whatever. There are logistics and things that you need to make sure that you are accounting for in order to make sure that you have the potential to have the best possible trip, right? If you instead just, um, you know, book a flight the day before, fly there, book a hotel as soon as you land, forget to bring money, et cetera, et cetera, it's not gonna go so well for you. So I wanna talk about everything I do, step-by-step -step process to find the tournament series I want to play, and then also to uh, make sure that I have the best chance for success at that tournament series. So first things first, you need to look at all the tournaments that you could possibly play, right? If you're a cash game player, you should definitely be looking at the tournament schedule. You may say, why? Well, if you're a cash game player, you're gonna find that the best cash games often pop up around poker tournaments. So this advice also applies to cash game players. I actually know four or five cash game players who I've played with a long time. I used to play with them at Bellagio at 5, 10, and 10, 20, no limit. And now I, I still see them traveling to every poker tournament stop and they don't play tournaments. They're there for the cash games. Why? Because a lot of people go there, they're playing way higher stakes than they want, they lose the tournament, they go on tilt, they want to play cash games, inevitably the good pros are there to make some money in the games. So this applies not only to cash tournament players, but also cash game players. So first things first, look at all your tournament options. And you will have a lot. Pretty much no matter where you live, there will be tournaments in your region. For example, um, for me personally, right? There's a tournament, I, I live in New York City. I can get down to Florida on a short flight. I don't really view that as a big commitment. So I could go to Florida to play at Hard Rock. They have Hard Rock poker tournaments uh, there, there all the time. They have a World Poker Tour tournament going on right now, I believe. Also in January, kind of near the same time as Party Poker UK is a tournament at Borgata which actually is just a three hour drive or two hour drive away from where I live. You may say, why would you go to Nottingham to play if you could just go right down the street to play? Well, it's a very, very important concept you must be aware of. And that is that you make money based on the amount that you buy in for, essentially. Assuming you're a good player, right? I'm going to try to play to try to make money. I'm not going to have a weekend to goof off in Atlantic City, right? And also, the problem with going to Atlantic City, there's a few problems for me personally, um, costs $300 to get there, there and back, whereas like a flight to Nottingham costs 1200 bucks, I think. So, you know, it's more expensive, but it's only half price, really. Um, next, the buy-in for the main event at Borgata is only... $3,500, right? Whereas the buy-in for Party Poker Series is, well, they have a 10,000 that you can play multiple times. They have a 5,000. They have two 2,000s. They have a 25,000 if it looks good. And you see the buy-ins are just way, 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 way higher. So would I rather spend a week to play, let me look at what my perceived buy-ins are, $50,000 in buy-ins if I don't play the 25K, or would I rather spend five days playing a $3,500 tournament, which probably comes out to like $6,000 out the door. So you make more money by investing $50,000 or $6,000. And that really is the question, right? If there's nothing else going on and I'm, I'm sitting here in New York City on the weekend and there's a Borgata tournament, sure, I'll hop up and go. But 
given I don't have a ton of time to play, and I know many of you don't have a ton, ton of time to play, you want to make sure you're playing the tournaments that give you the highest amount of um, money earned on average. I know a lot of people like to look at the guarantees. What's the guarantee? I don't think the guarantee matters all that much beyond the fact that Assume, beyond the fact that the guarantee will often get met. Now, what I mean by this is, let's say your local casino always gets a $500 buy-in, 300-person tournament with no guarantee. Okay? Fine. Let's say another tournament puts the same guarantee, or even a slightly higher guarantee on the tournament, but you have to go to get there. It's like, it doesn't really achieve anything, right? And... All the guarantee does is tell you how many people will be there. The idea of I can win, let's say a million dollars in a tournament or $15,000, whatever it is. Imagine the, the idea that you can win X amount of money in a tournament really doesn't matter to a professional because all that a professional cares about is how much is my return on investment. And also they care about the variance. Pros want to keep variance low. Pros would actually rather play smaller field events because assuming they're equally soft because you get to cash out your equity more often right you win the tournament more often if there's 50 people versus a thousand so i don't think the guarantee is what matters all that much what matters is your perceived return on investment as you play and get experience you will start to see in buy-ins of x amount you have x roi and higher buy-ins you have lower roi and higher up buy-ins of that you have even lower roi and uh, that's how it goes. So in theory, you want to be playing relatively soft games, right? So be aware of that. So why would I pick Party Poker UK over any other tournament series that's happening in January? Well, it's because they have a lot of events to play. And I know Party Poker runs a great tournament series. I have never been to Dust Till Dawn, to Nottingham. I've never been to where the, the, casino, the, the event's happening. But I have been to party poker events in the Bahamas and in Montreal. In both cases, they've been excellently ran. I've had no problems. They make it easy for you, <laughs> right? And it turns out low, like getting rid of barriers makes life easy. And so... like People always ask me why I don't go to insert any random tournament series in in uh, Europe or in China or whatever that's not run by either uh, either of the main poker sites. And the answer is it's just like a hassle, right? I, I don't need the hassle of having to deal with trying to find a hotel because they don't tell you where to stay, F trying to book a flight because they don't even tell you where you're going, trying to get money there because they don't tell you how to easily get money there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they make life easy. Also, Clark points out something very important. Yes, can you qualify for the millions UK from playing online. You can. In games where you can qualify from playing online, what inevitably happens is the people who get in for a $100 buy-in into this $10,000 buy-in tournament often are not $10,000 buy-in tournament caliber players. So that makes the main event especially very, very soft. And that is excellent. Also, um... They have side events around the, around the main event, and often those players will trickle into those side events, which makes those side events very great, too. Also, you know, Party Poker does put a big guarantee on their main events, on these, these events. I think the guarantee for this one is $5 million. Could be wrong about that. Maybe it's ten. Again, guarantee doesn't really matter to me all that much, because I know it's going to be a soft turn, because satellite players are playing. In general, satellite players are worse at tournaments than tournament players who would normally buy into the tournament themselves. Think about this, right? Is a $100 player who plays primarily games with a weird payout, such that 10% of the field gets paid, and no one wins, are those players going to be better or worse than the average player who goes and buys in to a $10,000 buy-in tournament? Clearly, they're not going to be as good because they're playing one one-hundredth of the size, and they're studying a game and getting experience in a game that is not like the main events. And those are exactly the players you want to be playing against, which is why you want to make sure you get to play with satellite qualifiers. And Party Poker, especially, does a great job of getting satellite qualifiers into tournaments. And you know, inevitably, some of them win. Draw says here, I mentioned my friend Scarmaker. 
La Zertow. He actually satellited into the um, Party Poker Online tournament last year, took third place for $1.3 million. So sometimes satellite players run it up. That said, I know Blas is actually really good at poker. He studies a lot and works really hard. Apparently he has a big stack in a very, very big tournament now too. So good, maybe he'll win. Do I ever play satellites to reduce your costs? So Steve, satellites don't reduce your cost. Think about it. They really don't. Because, let's say you break even in satellites, right? Let's presume you don't have a return on investment. All you're doing is parlaying, essentially, right? Parlaying works out, well, let's say you get into the next bigger tournament one in 10 times. So let's say you're playing $100 games. You win the $100 game, you get into a $1,000 game. You win the $1,000 game, you get into the $10,000 game. I know it doesn't quite work like that because there are like hotel expenses and whatnot that are baked into the big, the big buy-in. So maybe it's, I don't know exactly how they do it on Party Poker, but let's say it's one in 10, then one in 10. So that means you're one in 100 to get into the event you're trying to get into, right? Let's say you're good and you get in one in eight and then one in eight. Um, if that's the case, if you're one in eight and then one in eight, then you're one in 64. So you have an ROI, you have a positive ROI. But then the problem with satelliting in for most people is that, again, they are playing way outmatched against world-class players in the main event. Party Poker in Bahamas, the, the $10,000 tournament, there was a great example where my table was either like obviously recreational players or obviously world-class pros. And if you're the obviously recreational player, you really don't want to be battling against the obviously good pros, right? So be aware of that. Just, just be aware. That said, everyone's goal is to not make money. And this is very important to realize. And there's nothing wrong with playing poker or doing anything as a hobby to enjoy it, right? And one of the main draws of playing online poker for small stakes is that you can play these satellites and parlay it up and get to go to Nottingham or get to go to the Bahamas or Montreal or wherever they have the tournaments. And that is very, very, very Great, right? I mean, it gives you a great life experience. And that's fantastic, right? So I'm all for satellites. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. But they increase variance significantly. Assuming you're playing mainly like $100 games because you only cash out. Well, let's say you're 1 in 64 to get into the main event. Then you're like 1 in what? 1 in 8 to cash the main event? What is that? I can't even do the math. What's eight times eight divided by 64 to 64 times eight? I think that's it. 64 times eight. Someone do the math. <coughs> Definitely can't do math whenever I'm coughing, that's for sure. 64 times eight is whatever that is. You're really not going to cash the main event very often at all if you're getting into a much, much, much bigger tournament. So you only cash very, very rarely. Even then, you don't cash very often. I mean, you don't cash for a large percentage, a large amount all that often, right? That's how often you get a min cash. How often you take top five places or top 10 places out of a thousand person tournament? One in a hundred? So something like that if you're break even. So let's say you're one in a hundred instead of uh, one in eight. So now you're one in 256,000? No, 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 no. Now you're one in, one in 6,400. 6, you're one in 6,400 to get a good score, a life-changing score when you enter that first satellite. So if you play 6,400 satellites, you'll probably get a big score out of it. Otherwise, your bankroll is just going to go straight down. That's not so good. So anyway, be aware of that. That um, just, just be aware of the game you're playing, right? There's nothing wrong with playing games that are high variance. I mean, people play parlays at sports books all the time, and they, they, they're fine. They're fun, fun and exciting. But they are a way that's going, a way to play poker that's going to jack the variance up. It's not really what we're talking about today. Let's get off that topic. Next, we found a tournament series we want to play. They have buy-ins that are great for you. Uh, you're properly bankrolled to handle it. Make sure you're properly bankrolled to handle the tournament. This tournament has, um, like I said, 10,000 games, 5,000 games, and 2,000 games for me. I'm properly bankrolled to handle all of those. They have a 25K. I have to sell a bit of action, which is fine. Um, if it's good, I'll play. If it's not good, I won't play. I'll be prepared to play. But if it's not good, I won't play. If it's good, I will. So... Make sure you're properly bankrolled. Next, we know we're going. It's time to start booking a flight. 
How do I book a flight? And the way I book a flight is probably a fishy way to book the flight, but it's easy and quick. I'll go to Google Flights and Kayak, both of them, and I will search where I'm flying from, which is NYC. I'm not flying from um, specifically JFK or LaGuardia or Newark. I'm just flying from NYC, which searches the three main regional airports. Well, the three airports in this region. And then I say where I am going. And now, interestingly enough, I've never been to Nottingham. I don't know anything about it. And I had to do some research. Turns out there's actually a few airports in the vicinity. <coughs> but it really doesn't make sense to fly to London because London is a few hours away from Nottingham. So like a drive, few hours away drive. So it means I'm gonna have to have a stop somewhere because there are apparently no direct flights from New York City to Nottingham. So that's fine. Recognize that that's where we are and do it. So I found that airport I wanted to go to. You can just search on Google, um, like Nottingham Airport or England airports, right? And it'll bring up all the major airports on the map. You can look up their, their call signal, which is, I don't even know what it is for Nottingham, like JFK, for example. And then um, search flights to those places. And then inevitably you'll come up with the right, you'll come up with a reasonable place. So then you look for flights that have a short duration. I don't want to be stuck in the airport for forever. Then you look for flights that um, don't cost a lot of money, right? You don't want to be paying $5,000 for a flight and you could pay $1,200. I think mine was $1,200 there and back. And, um, and that's it. And I found a flight that goes to the, the closest casino to the, um, to the venue. And then that's it. Nice and easy. Want to make sure your departing flight leaves probably the day after the poker series ends. I love the way Party Poker sets up their tournament series, by the way, where they have the main event kind of at the beginning of the series, and then they have um, a bunch of tournaments afterwards. So even if you bust the main event, you can continue playing other tournaments. Oh, I forgot to mention, they also have a $1,000 tournament there that I believe starts on the 4th. And um, so I'm, I'm actually arriving on the 4th, I think. Yeah, I arrive on the 4th. I can play the 1,000 on the 4th and the 5th. So yeah, it's not on my schedule for some reason. I need to get it on my schedule. <coughs> Again, I apologize for being under the weather here. I'm here for all of you. I don't mind. I'll be sick for all of you. I'll fight through it. Um, so, what else? Next thing to book hotels. I book hotels after I book flights. Why? Because you don't exactly know when the flight is going to line up. Because every once in a while, what happens is you may not be able to get a flight for the day you want. Now, this is going to be even more true as you get to go as you go to more and more regional-ish type places, um, like in America. If you're flying to a Heartland Poker Tour tournament, maybe you can't get a flight for the day you want to get it. Especially if you're flying kind of last second. C says, where are you flying to? I don't know. It's on my calendar. People always ask me these things. I actually don't know the details. Once I, once I book something, out of mind. It's on my calendar. I wake up. But what I do every day before I go to bed, I look at my calendar and see what I need to do. Sometimes I set an alarm, alarm a week ahead of time if I need to. So I look at my calendar and then I will do whatever it says to do. I wake up, it'll say fly. To Nottingham, I'll get on the plane and I'll fly to Nottingham. Only 13 likes, come on man, says Kevin Smith. Click like everyone, it's free for you and it actually helps me, believe it or not. Okay, so we book our flight, then we book our hotel. Make sure that you, um, you look at the venues or the, the tournaments website to see if they have any sort of discounts to various hotels. Party Poker almost always does. So, what you can do is you can um, look there. If the term is taking place at a casino, call the casino. Ask for the poker rate. If you like to gamble, call your host, right? You want to make sure you're not paying expenses that you don't need to be paying. And, um, like, that kind of thing just keeps costs down significantly. Like, let's say you go there and you would normally pay $3,000 for a hotel for 10 days. If you can get a rate for hundred dollars a day, you save two thousand dollars. It's like a it's like a free free buy into a tournament, right? You want a free buy into a tournament? Yes. 
So get that. Next, get your money ready. You need to make sure that you have your money prepared. Now you can do this in various ways. I personally, for party poker events, just send my money to my party poker account. And that's nice and easy. There's a Skype group that I am part of and it's like high stakes transfers. You post what you want. I need $50,000 party poker money. I have US bank wire. Somebody will immediately get back to me and they'll say, let's make a trade. Everybody in the group is vetted and vouched for, et cetera, et cetera. You can get hard vouchers from other people who you know and trust. Then you send the money and you're good to go. Never had a problem. I'm sure now everyone's gonna try to scam me. <laughs> but that's a nice easy way to get money into Party Poker, Skrill, Net Teller, Bitcoin, whatever you want. US Bank, cash in New York City, whatever you need. So try to get respected, get vouched for, and then you just have easy access and easy flow of funds. If you don't have that, you have to go through a little bit slower process of uploading money into like Skrill or Net Teller. I know Party Poker has, I think it's called, it's called Luxor. I think they have a new payment processor that is very integrated into Party Poker. So you have to spend a little bit of time getting your money into that, take that money, send it into Party Poker. It may take you a little bit longer, but whatever, it's fine. So make sure your money's loaded up into your Party Poker account. If you are, <coughs> if you are not, I'm going to put your money in Party Poker and instead I'm going to wire the money. Make sure you get the right wire information. Send it to the casino. Call the casino. Make sure it arrived. Make sure you know exactly where to go to get it. Otherwise, you'd be in a mess. I made the mistake the first time I went to the World Series where I um, sent my money. I had like $100,000 or something like that. I sent $100,000 to the Rio. They just lost it for like five days. So I had no money for five days. That was a lot of fun. Um, so I was always check and double check and, and recheck. I see a lot of you typing comments. Let's reply to them. Do I ever bluff? Yes. Why would you not bluff? Do you fly the red eye to get over to UK? You're some people prefer. I definitely prefer red eyes. I don't even know what I'm flying. I don't think I'm flying the red eye. Mm, actually, yes, I am flying the red eye. I fly at 9 p.m. That's all coming back to me. I fly at 9 p.m. So yes, I definitely prefer red eye. Where'd my video from Acevedo go? The video from Acevedo is in the Poker Coaching Premium section at pokercoaching.com slash premium. We had a, um, a, a marathon for Thanksgiving just to give you all a preview of the content that we have at Poker Coaching Premium. So we had a lot of um, exclusive content there for about three days. Then we took it down. Where did it go? You couldn't finish it. Well, it's in Poker Coaching Premium. By the way, where, if you want to get Poker Coaching and Poker Coaching Premium at an extreme discount, Check out right now, pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. We have extreme discounts on many of my products, including Poker Coaching Premium, so you can get back in there and finish that Michael Acevedo video. And that actually brings me to my next point, which is studying. Make sure you know how to play poker well. I have a whole month between now and Party Poker Millions UK, so I need to make sure I'm studying. So what did I do? And all of my forethought, I hired the best GTO expert, Michael Acevedo, and in my opinion, the best exploitative poker player, Jonathan Jaffe, to make content for me, for Poker Coaching Premium, which I'm in turn giving to all of the members, right? So I am studying from the people who are the absolute best in the world and things they are the best at. And when you're playing high stakes tournaments against high stakes poker players who are great, you sure better know GTO strategies very, very well. And when you're playing against recreational players, you sure better know exploitative strategies very, very, very well. So I hire the two people who I think are the best in the world at that, and um, I'm very, very happy. Kevin says, poker coach and cream is the best. It's a great value. Well, that's the goal. Make it so good to the point that you'd be silly not to buy it. So study. Again, if you want to get access to those videos, also, we have quizzes, homework challenges, interactive webinars where you can um, ask your questions in real time. Check that out. How do you suggest a topic for this show? Email support at pokercoaching.com. <coughs> if you're near the top of your range, but beat, do you still have to call? Well, if you know you're beat, obviously no. You're making an exploitative play, right? If you're playing against someone who literally has only the nuts because they are so bad, if your opponents are so bad to where you know they are literally never bluffing you, then just fold everything, right? Easy game.
Let's see. Oh my goodness. Daniel says, you agree with David Einhorn that I'm an excellent teacher. I do my best. You also play with Stephen Beglider sometime. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Only two losing weeks in the last three months. Fantastic. That's exactly what we like to hear. Good job. Good work. Let's see. You're playing on a side of bunch. You were crushing for two weeks playing 50 no limit, and you're in a crazy downswing. What's a crazy downswing mean? 100 buy-ins, 200 buy-ins. Make sure you quantify the things that you are doing. Why is range important? Because it lets you know how the default strategy, or how you should be playing your default strategy, right? Also lets you know how your opponents are playing. And whenever, like when you say why is range important, when you say my opponent is literally never bluffing me, you're saying that I think his range is exactly the nuts. You're using range, right? You're using the idea of ranges right there. You think his range is so nitty that it is only the nuts. Let's see. Okay, Soldier Magic Collection for 3,000 bucks. It hurts a little, but it's way better ROI. Well, it certainly has a future, whereas um, you know, Magic probably is just not going to make you a whole lot of money. It's going to suck a lot of time. That said again, nothing wrong with having a hobby. Hobbies are great. It's not like I need a decongestant. I need um, to be healed is what I need. All right, so study a lot. Next. Get off drugs. Now, um, I know a lot of you are drug users who love your drugs. I have a little drug right here, a little bit of caffeine in the morning. Before you go to play a tournament series, I personally make a point to get off of whatever I'm on and try to just be on water and green tea. And the reason is because when you go play the tournament, you may need to have a hit of caffeine late in the day. Especially whenever you know, you're know you playing high stakes scenarios against good players and you're kind of getting lethargic. You want to make sure you don't have to drink 15 cups of coffee at 9 p.m. to be awake for the next three hours. You need to have one. So I suggest you do your best to get off whatever drugs you are on. Um, I think it's very important to get off of alcohol before you go to play poker tournaments. Um, I have slacked on that a little bit, and so I actually have not had any drinks in two weeks, believe it or not. I think I'm done with drinking. Don't really need any more in my life. Um, who was shouting, who was smoking a joint as Jonathan shouted, get off, get off the drugs? Look, I mean, I pretty much trust anyone who has a lot of data, and uh, I'm part of the Pokart backing group, and they have lots of data on things like drug usage, among back ease. Turns out the drug users among back ease do a whole lot worse than the non-drug users. And, um, you know, if you look at a lot of the absolute best players in the world, some of them do a lot of drugs, but most of them don't do much of anything. And I don't think I'm an exception to the rule. So I think it's probably best just to get off of the drugs. So get off those. Also, um, get in good shape, right? Make sure you're working out, like kind of hard before you go to play poker, and generally all the time, when you're not playing poker, I think you need to be working out decently hard. And that's to get in good shape. Again, I've been lack slacking in this. Turns out having two kids sucks away all of your time to do anything. But um, it's, uh, it's important to be in good shape. Being in good shape and not being on outside um, chemicals, I think is, it can't hurt, right? Maybe it could hurt. I mean, to be fair, like maybe there is some magic drug out there that makes you a genius. I don't know if they found it yet, but um, it's definitely not the commonly used ones. So anyway, get in shape. When you do go to play the poker series, by the way, I do not think you actually want to be working out all that hard. Funny enough, I had a view of the gym um, while I was in the Bahamas. I saw Martin... Jakobsen out there. He was out there with a giant kettlebell. I think it was a 40-pound kettlebell. He was basically like juggling the kettlebell for like an hour. He was, he was getting after it. And he is he is in good shape. It's very, very, um, very, very uh, inspiring to see. Like he was up, waking up at 10 a.m. out there, juggling the kettlebell for an hour in all sorts of various ways. It got me excited to like get up and go to the gym. Um, so anyway, I don't think you need to work out super hard. Because if you are not accustomed to working out super hard, while you are, um, 
while you are playing poker, you may end up just being very, very, very tired, right? So if you're like if you're used, I mean, for all I know, maybe that was his light workout, right? So if that is his light workout, it makes logical sense, right? Because he's in amazing shape. Um, but if, like, say you never work out and then you go to play a poker series and you decide, all right, I'm going to get in good shape now that I'm here playing poker, it's probably not ideal, right? Um, next, get on the right sleep schedule. I think getting on the right sleep schedule is highly important, especially if you're traveling somewhere. Now, if you normally, look, no, look you can't always um, be on the right sleep schedule. I get that. Say you, like, like I'm a good example, right? I wake up at 6 a.m. with my kids. If I um, need to wake up at 10 a.m. to go play the poker series, I just cannot really get on the right sleep schedule. Because I'm not just going to start tell my wife, hey, I need to wake up at 10 a.m. now. You're with the kids in the morning. It doesn't work. So um, this isn't going to work for me. But if you are a single person, you kind of control your own schedule, and you know you're going to go to England, which is six hours ahead, well, make sure you get six hours ahead before you go. That way you don't experience jet lag, right? Some people complain about jet lag, like, oh, I'm jet lagged. I mean, get over it, plan ahead, and fix the problem. So I know that I cannot realistically get on the right sleep schedule in New York City with my life set up. Fine, so what do we do instead? Make a point to arrive at least a day ahead of time. Like I said, I'm arriving on the 4th. Um, in the morning, all right, at the fourth in the morning. That's gonna give me plenty of time to get there, figure out where I am, figure out where to eat, and also check into the hotel, take a nap, and ideally get on the right sleep schedule. That'll be useful, right? I do not recommend flying in the day of a poker tournament unless it's like exactly on the same time zone. Like I'll fly into Florida um, directly from New York because it's the same time zone and it works out decently well and I can sleep on the airport. But, um, that, that's pretty much it. Or like, I'll go to Borgata the day of. But pretty much anywhere else. I guess Montreal. I, I don't even do Montreal the day of. I try to go a day ahead of time. I think that's pretty important. People keep talking about CBD oil for some reason. And um, I think it's pretty much been proven to not really do a whole lot or people don't even know exactly what it does. Be careful putting in things that have not been studied significantly. I th think a lot of people just try things because everybody else is trying things. I mean, like vaping pens are a good example of this, right? Now we have all the kids dying. And just because the kids are using it does not mean that it is good. Just because all your friends use it does not mean it is good. Alcohol is a good example of this. I've been studying a ton about it. And... Turns out, it's um, it's it's actually quite bad for you. I'm not gonna get into all this, these the details, but anyway, it's quite bad for you. You really want to do something that's quite bad for you, even though everybody else does it. Probably not, right? Um, let's see. Dust till dawn's in the middle of an industrial area. You think I've been there before? Right? I've never been there before. Rob Young is a fan. I do like Rob Young. CBD oil is an herbal extract coach. Don't vape it. Yes, clearly. Don't vape it. That's not what I'm telling you to do. Hopefully you do not understand what I'm... Hopefully you understand what I'm saying. But the idea of I'm going to take a random oil and rub it on me it's going to fix my problems is... Not a good idea. Anyway. Anyway, anyway. I, I think most of you will find that if you just stop dealing with nonsense... Um, outside, outside, outside influences, right? Just be careful. Just be careful. And I, I guarantee you, everyone here who is saying things, listen, I, I'm sure that you do not doubt your experience. The issue is, though, that your experience is often flawed by social in influences, marketing, etc. right? And realize, I'm just trying to help all of you here. And you need to be very, very careful doing random things. It's like homeopathic medicine. Pretty much, Simon. That's exactly right. Anyway. Anyway, guys. Be careful. Take care of yourself. And um, just be smart. All right. Next. Be good on the trip. Be good on the trip. This is very important as well. So a lot of people, myself included sometimes, which I'm going to be better about this, um... 
is once you go to play the poker stop, inevitably what happens is there are going to be a lot of friends there, a lot of neat people you want to meet, a lot of um, parties, right, that you can go to. Almost every night, Party Poker has a, a party of some sort, which is great fun. But you really don't need to be out there partying all night, right? And inevitably what happens is you go to the party, you see some friends, your friends are having a party, you have a party with your friends, you end up staying up till 1 a.m. or 4 a.m. or all night. Then comes time to play the tournament the next day and you are ruined. Look, I'm, a bad, I'm an example of someone who has done this very poorly multiple times. And it's not good. You'll show up, you'll play poker, you'll be hungover, you'll be unhappy, you'll be regretting the fact that you made a poor decision. And you don't need to make poor decisions. You need to make good decisions. And the good decision is to, you know, go have fun with your friends, but have strict, strict guidelines. Maybe your guideline is one drink and go to bed by 11 p.m. I think that is certainly reasonable, right? You want to make sure you have discipline. I mean, you're going to find that to be a good, successful poker player long term, you need to have a decent amount of discipline. And that is not just at the poker table. That is away from the table as well. Perhaps even more so away from the table. You need to make sure you're studying. You need to make sure you are treating yourself like a mental athlete. And you need to make sure that you are playing properly and preparing properly. Like, I mean, take any professional athlete, right? Do you really think that their routine before a big game the next day would be to have a bottle of wine, smoke a blunt, stay up till 4 a.m., and then wake up five minutes before the tournament starts? I'm talking to myself here, not just all of you. The answer is obviously no. That would be, like, they'd be fired immediately. Maybe not fired immediately. So they, they would have a coach who would hopefully help them get their act together. But uh, you only have yourself to get your act together. And you got to get your act together. And that is something that is required for you. And, um, again, I know that there are a lot of people out there who have, look, look at this exception to the rule. But realize you're probably not the exception to the rule. You really probably just aren't. I'm not, and um, you're going to have way better results when you are thinking clearly and are in good, tip-top physical shape. So anyway, anyway, anyway. Michigan's expected to legalize online poker before Christmas. Nice. Keyword expected to. You downloaded the Prime Mind. Um, at by Elliot Rowe. Yeah, that's great. Elliot Rowe has a lot of great work. He helps many of the absolute top performing poker players in the world. I've worked with him myself. I have Prime Mind on my phone. I use it. And uh, definitely check it out. So be good on the trip. And that will be very, very beneficial for you. So I'm pretty sick, everyone. So I think I'm going to go rest. I have a four hour long webinar today where I'm going to answer questions for four hours. So I should probably conserve my voice. I can already tell it's going. And that's not good. I, I mean, do we even go here? Let's see. I think a lot of people get defensive when you, I guess, make it aware that they may not be doing the right thing. People like to think they are doing the right thing. And when it becomes just crystal clear they're not, they either react in one of two ways. Either they change, which is great, or they feel an immense amount of resistance because they are subconsciously regretful of the fact that they have been making mistakes, right? And, um, you know, Poker Wally here is kind of saying what I want to say. You think it's okay to consume alcohol because it's legal and socially okay. Alcohol is the worst drug ever. Uh, apparently it kills lots and lots of people each year. I'm not a scientist, just a random poker player. And um, it's just my opinion, so take it for what it's worth. You need to realize that just because you do something, just because your friends do something, does not necessarily mean it is good and beneficial for you and your life. And I mean, I can already tell you for me, personally, 
just purely speaking for me, um, whenever I go out and I have a bunch of drinks before I go to bed the, uh, the day, like let's say I go out with a bunch of friends and have a party, and then come home and go to bed at 3 a.m. and I wake up at 6 a.m. to deal with kids, I'm not with it, right? Do I really need that in my life? Did I actually even have a whole lot of, um, maybe I had enjoyment in the experience, but you don't remember half of it, right? Alcohol is a good way to um, essentially take a little bit of happiness now in exchange for a lot of happiness later because I'll be out of it for the next day. And if you lack discipline, if you put things in your body that will hurt yourself, things are gonna go wrong. And I, look, I have lacked discipline in the past and I have put plenty of things in my body that are not good in the past. Anyway, look, I just don't want you to have the pain that I have felt in my past. And I can tell you all, easiest way to do that is recognize how detrimentally terrible most of these drugs are. Or if they're not detrimentally terrible, they don't even do a whole lot. They're kind of irrelevant. If they're irrelevant, why waste your time? If they're detrimentally terrible, get off of it. So anyway, I love all of you and I want you to be the best versions of yourself. And I know that like I've screwed up in a lot of ways and um, I don't want you to screw up like I've screwed up. Learn from me, learn from my mistakes. All right, have a great day, enjoy yourselves. Again, check out pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. We have lots of sales for you where you can learn from the people who I learn from. And also, even if you are not already a top level poker player, we have plenty of content to help you get there. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Enjoy yourselves. Click like, click subscribe. Share it with your friends. Have a great day.